Hello everyone and welcome to today's second Cambridge University Press ELT webinar. I'm very pleased to welcome Jean Lambert as today's presenter. Jean is the series editor of Final Draft, a new academic series, academic writing series by Cambridge University Press. Jean has 20 years of ESL classroom teacher training and materials writing experience. She's taught at Columbia University, City University of New York, and the New School, specialising in academic writing and English for academic purposes. She's worked as an ESL methods practicum instructor and currently teaches academic writing at the New School. Over to you, Jean. Thank you, Alastair, and welcome everyone to Written Corrective Feedback, Effective for Students, Time Saving for Teachers. Thank you all for attending at what I know is a very busy time of the semester. Many of you are getting ready to give your finals. My primary goal today is to present on WCF, and I'll use WCF throughout. My primary goal is to spark dialogue, some here today, but also hopefully for you to extend the dialogue with your colleagues. The research, as you will hear, is somewhat mixed with some positive evidence for certain types of feedback. Given this mixed picture and some of the issues with WCF we will discuss, I believe we need more awareness and discussion about how to provide WCF and how much we provide. OK, let's kick off the dialogue with this image. How many of you relate to this picture after a weekend spent grading papers? Perhaps some of you will write in the chat box. I see, I see yes, me, me, me. <laughs> I felt that this image captured how I feel after a weekend spent grading. Grading papers, as we all know, and as many of you are saying in the chat box, can be very mentally draining. But on a serious note, how many of you experience this? You spend hours correcting a set of papers, you hand them back to your students, and then you get back second drafts and see that there is little change from the first draft. How often do you have that happen? I see many responding, yes, yes. You can see that as well, right? Absolutely. Corrective feedback is one of the most time-consuming parts of our teaching practice, yet we often wonder if it's making a difference if our students hear or understand our feedback. And if we calculate the hours we spend grading per week times the number of weeks and times the number of years we spend grading, that's a significant amount of time. And so I think we need to rethink how we spend these hours. Before I move on with the rest of the webinar, I'd love to hear from some of you about your methods for corrective feedback. Can I have some volunteers write in the chat box the ways you provide feedback? What are your favorite methods? Do you treat uh, one draft, the first draft, differently than the second? Uh, I see some are already saying right now that they like to use correction symbols. Some like to use error codes. Some have a rubric. Wow, a real variety of different ways to give feedback. It's terrific. Uh, I think it's extremely useful to hear what others do. We don't often get a chance to find out what our colleagues are doing with corrective feedback unless you ask them directly, and I've, I've started to do that more and more. So some of the ways that you've shared and that you're sharing right now, highlighting, coding, peer feedback, some of those are going to come up in the webinar, and we can come back to them later in the Q&A session. Just briefly now, I'll provide the agenda for the rest of the webinar. I'm going to talk first about the importance of WCF and issues related. I'll provide a typology of WCF and some of the issues with different types of feedback. I'm going to give you an overview of research, of the research. And then I'm going to provide some recommended approaches based on my own teaching practice. And then at the end, I'm hoping for a spirited Q&A dialogue period. Okay, so let's start off with why this is so important. Why did we all want to join this webinar today? Well, some of the reasons that WCF is important is that it dovetails with our students' academic goals, whether our students want to move to the next level of ESL or succeed in college, like many of my current students do. I have undergraduate students right now. Uh, 
writing is the key for all of those things, and we feel that WCF can help improve our students' writing. Uh, WCF also aligns with the dominant philosophy of learning in our field, which is active learning. Right? We think that WCF is a way for students to actively edit their own work and become their own best editors. It's also a large slice of the writing pedagogy pie. If we're just talking the sheer number of hours, I would say that it takes up quite a lot of time what we do. If we think about the amount of time devoted to lesson planning and in-class instruction, grading papers each week, and then the amount of time our students spend reviewing those papers, that takes up a lot of our, our writing instruction time. Students want and expect WCF, right? We might have a little revolution on our hands in our classes if we didn't provide feedback, and teachers expect to provide it. And finally, there's the issue of accuracy in writing. Accuracy in writing is often viewed differently than speaking, right? We tend to tolerate a certain amount of error in speaking that we don't tolerate in writing, and that's true also for native speakers of English. We have this idea that writing should be error-free, and because of that, our ESL students could be negatively affected in their classes, and certainly accuracy is a major factor in departmental and standardized writing exams. So a student may be doing really well with ideas and maybe organization, but if they lack accuracy, they may not pass a departmental or standardized writing exam, right? OK, all of that's fine, right? But there are some issues with WCF. First of all, it's very time consuming for teachers and students. Right? We, we sometimes forget how time consuming it can be for students because we're so busy uh, grading so many papers. But depending on the type of feedback we give, students could also spend quite a bit of time on the revision, perhaps more time than we've actually given to correcting the paper. Students may not review our WCF carefully, and that's for a whole host of reasons. Right? Students may not understand our WCF. That may depend on the type of WCF we're giving, or that may just be uh, the student not understanding the issue. Some WCF may not be effective. Right? It may not be effective generally, but it may not be effective for the student. And then finally, some teachers may have trouble identifying errors or giving feedback. You know, we're all at different stages in our career, and especially newer teachers may struggle with this. Even if you've taken grammar classes in your TESOL degree, there are so many gray areas in language, and it takes a long time to expand your linguistic repertoire as a teacher. OK, now I'd like to provide a typology of WCF. And I'm mostly doing this so that we're all on the same page in terms of the terminology when we get to the research section. But I also want to take the opportunity to discuss some issues that come up with different types of feedback. The first type is direct WCF. This is an explicit form of error correction where we cross out the error and include the correct form, usually above the error. There's typically minimal processing on the part of the student, right? Because we've given them the correct form. If you cross out most of the errors in a student's paper and give the correct forms, can anyone say what the issue might be for learning? Just give everyone a minute to, what, what, what might be an issue with this type of feedback? OK, someone said that it might be discouraging. OK, passive learning, right? OK, someone said passive learning. That's interesting. They don't learn how to make the mistakes, how to correct the mistakes on their own. They don't learn how to self-edit. OK, lots of great responses, right? We do worry that this doesn't connect with our philosophy of active learning. And we wonder if students will really be able to internalize many of these forms. The hazard here, especially if they work quickly, is that they may just try to fix the errors. And we turn this into a typing process, not uh, a thinking process, and not a learning process. Of course, if students reviewed perhaps a few errors that were given with direct WCF carefully, that might be a different story. But I think that as teachers, we do worry that students will quickly go through and just make our corrections and not have had a richer learning experience that we want them to have. This type of feedback, though, is probably the least frustrating for students. 
because they have the correct form, right? They aren't struggling with how to repair the error, right? But we do have questions about that in terms of philosophy of learning. Okay, the next type is indirect feedback. This is where we point out errors without correcting. You may think of this as underlining or circling. Some of you mentioned that earlier in the chat, right? So we may underline errors and not give the correct form. And this does align well with our view of active learning, but there is a lot more processing on the part of the learner and potentially more frustration if we have many different errors corrected and underlined, and especially if there are errors that students perhaps haven't worked on in the past, that could be frustrating and that could lead uh, maybe to discouragement. The next type that I'd like to discuss is metalinguistic. This is where we provide more linguistic information. You may know this is error coding. Some of you mentioned codes in the chat earlier. This is where we maybe give students an error code handout and ask them to uh, repair the error on their own. So we give them more linguistic information. We give them, maybe we say SVA, above a subject verb agreement error. And so they can um, repair, the, they can you know, actively repair on their own. So we've identified the error for them, but they have to repair it. So much more processing than direct, but potentially maybe still some frustration, like with indirect feedback. OK. And then there's focused and unfocused, which I think is pretty straightforward. Um, with focused feedback, you target one, two, maybe three types of errors, and you leave all the other errors uncorrected. In unfocused, or also known as comprehensive, you correct all or most of the errors. And can someone say what might be an issue with unfocused feedback? Does anyone want to? Take that one on. Some are saying overwhelming. OK. Too much, too much to do. Unfocused WCF, someone's saying unfocused learning. Right. Yes, I th it takes a lot of time. OK, lots of great points that are being made. I think with unfocused feedback, I think in theory in our field, we believe that focused feedback is more useful because unfocused could lead to cognitive overload. Um, someone said overwhelming. However, I found in practice that many times teachers actually do correct all of the errors. And uh, the more and more I've been asking my colleagues about what they do, I'm finding that many, in fact, do give unfocused feedback. And some of the reasons that have been communicated to me are that they don't want to leave errors unattended. That's a concern. And another concern is that is related to accountability. So those of us that are in programs where students are receiving grades, there's sort of a pressure to make sure that all errors are, are uh, the student is made aware of all errors. And there, there's this sense of accountability and needing to log, you know, give a big picture of what the students um, can do. We're going to come back to this later, I think that this is an issue that we need to discuss in our field because of the disconnect between what is, I think, a common wisdom and maybe what many of us are doing in practice. I'd like to just mention two other types. And I'm not going to discuss these types during the research section, mainly because there's a smaller body of literature for these types. But I did want to mention them, especially for newer teachers. Uh, one is electronic WCF. And this is where you're working electronically, and you can in, embed a concordance file next to an error. And a student can click on that link, and they'll be sent to a file that gives them examples of correct usage for whatever grammar point that you're working on. OK, that's not something that I've uh, worked with extensively, but I have worked a lot with reformulation. And that's where you create a native speaker version of a student's original. And the key here is to try to keep the original intact as much as possible in terms of meaning, but make a native speaker version with all of the errors corrected. So procedurally, if we're thinking about how that would work out, you, if you have a sentence, 
that is maybe wordy and has a subject verb agreement error. You might fix those two things, try to keep the original meaning, then the student would have their original to compare with your revision. And can anyone think about what might be an issue that would come up with this process? Does anything come to mind? Someone said appropriation. Okay, someone said time explanation point. <laughs> I do think, and someone else is saying time consuming. Yes, someone says, are, are the native speakers the, uh, versions the only ones that are valid? That's interesting. I think that this is time consuming. Uh, I do think that uh, you can focus this, if you're interested in experimenting with it, to a very short piece. So you don't have to reformulate an entire paragraph, for example. You could just target this if you wanted to. But yes, lots of interesting issues that are coming up for that. Now I'd like to turn to the types covered in this next research section. I'll mainly touch upon direct, indirect, metalinguistic, and focused and unfocused. Okay? And I'm going to present uh, this research section chronologically starting in the 80s and bringing us up to about 2012. And once we're there, uh, you'll have an overview of the research picture of where we stand today. Okay, so I'm going to start in the 80s. Um, in the 80s, we had a number of studies that found little to no difference between providing direct and indirect feedback. Unfortunately, many of those studies had design and methodology limitations. Many lacked a control group, for example, and you can imagine why many teacher researchers would not want to include a control group. It means some group of students receives no feedback, right? But there are also other issues with these studies, such as differing task types for pre and post tests. So while these studies are a contribution to the literature, we interpret them cautiously. Then we head into the 90s, and what, what happens in the literature is that a debate erupts. We get a spirited debate over whether to correct grammar errors or not. Take a moment now to imagine this. Can you imagine not correcting your student's grammar and writing at all? So I'm already getting some no answers to that. So I know I cannot. OK, so I have, I have one person that says, yeah. OK, a couple of people that say yes. It looks like the majority say yes, and there's some, uh, some maybes. So perhaps this is something that will come up again in the Q&A. This could be an interesting uh, dialogue. But it looks like the overwhelming majority of folks are saying that, no, they can't imagine not correcting their grammar errors at all. But Dr. John Trescott called for just that in the Language Learning Journal in 1996, and that sparked this debate. I urge you to read his case against grammar correction. It's a very interesting read, but I've summarized most of his key points here. He was against grammar error correction because he felt at the time research showed that it was ineffective. He also felt that WCF didn't align well with the nature of language learning, which is gradual. He also felt that there were potential harmful side effects to grammar correction, uh, one being the impact on students' attitude toward writing, you know, with the idea that no one wants to be wrong all the time. I certainly relate to that. He also talked about the amount of time and energy it takes up in writing classes, and he felt that could be better used doing other things, perhaps uh, more writing instruction or perhaps more writing practice on the part of the student. And he also cited some of the practical problems with correction that we touched upon earlier. Teachers might not recognize an error, and if they do, students might not understand their explanation. I wanted to provide a quote here to fully contextualize his point of view. Trescott is not anti-accuracy. For Trescott, the issue is not the value of grammatical accuracy. The issue is whether or not grammar co correction can contribute to its development. Okay, so for Trescott, he feels that it doesn't contribute to its development. Okay, but he was not without his critics. And the main rebuttal came from Dana Ferris, who is now at the University of California, Davis. And her, her main point in her case for grammar correction in the Journal of Second Language Writing uh, 
was that the research is incomplete and inconclusive. And because of that, we perhaps shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater for a long-standing tradition that students expect and teachers also expect. Um, I think she also felt that you know, we don't have conclusive evidence for every teaching practice that we have, but we don't sort of just give up on it. And she also felt that Trescott perhaps overlooked some of the positive evidence and overstated some of the negative. She did concede, however, that we didn't have well-designed studies at that point that they're having this debate. And she called for more research. And she has actually contributed quite a bit of research uh, to the field. Then if we can jump to 2008, Trescott decides to conduct his own original research with a colleague. And they are able to uh, avoid some of the significant design and methodology flaws of the earlier studies. So they do include a control group. Okay. So his study, their study, is in an EFL context at a public university in Taiwan. Okay. They had an experimental group that received indirect feedback in the form of underlining errors. And they had a control group that received no feedback. Okay. What they found were short-term gains in accuracy for the experimental group that received indirect WCF. And they found that it was significant. The experimental group far outperformed the control group in terms of short-term gains for accuracy. However, they found little to no statistical difference in error rates between the two groups when a new piece of writing was introduced. So at the end of the 14-week study, when a new piece of writing was introduced, the error rates between the two groups was marginal. Okay? So their conclusion is that WCF is a good revision tool, but perhaps not a learning tool. Much the same way if you cram for an exam, you will do well the next morning, but perhaps four weeks later you won't do as well. Right? And perhaps some of you have even, perhaps this confirms some of your experience where you see your students making improvements in drafts and you think, oh, this is going great. And then they take that final exam uh, in the department at the end and they don't pass. And you wonder, well, that seems like a disconnect. Maybe this sort of confirms some of that. Okay. One thing, though, that I would ask about this study in particular is what would it have been like to have a second experimental group that received direct WCF? I would have liked to have seen what would happen there. But do we have other long-term, well-designed studies? We do. We have a number of studies that also um, study long-term gains. And there are three studies that are represented here. The first study, the Van Boyegen et al., the 2008, is actually a pilot study for the 2012 study listed here. And both of those studies were with um, Dutch secondary school learners. And the second study that you see listed, the 2010 study, the Bichner and Nock, is um, in an ESL context at a university in the US. So we have two different settings here. Both found that direct and indirect WCF was effective for short-term gains. Right? So this confirms the Trescott study, and it confirms earlier studies that we had that really showed the same thing. However, they also found that direct feedback was more effective for long-term gains. Right? And sometimes this surprises colleagues. You know, They hope that indirect feedback will show the most gains. Um, let me just say that this is some positive evidence for direct feedback. It's not conclusive evidence. It's just these are well-designed studies that we can look to, and it's sort of like sort of raising a hand and saying, here's something to maybe look at further. It's not conclusive evidence necessarily. Um, the Bichner and Nock in particular found the most long-term gains for the direct group that also received metalinguistic explanations. So when an error was pointed out and a grammatical explanation was given at the same time, that group made the most gains. A limitation of this study, perhaps, though, is that it only focuses on two uses of the English article system. Maybe hard for us to extrapolate to other grammar points. Okay. Now I'd like to talk about focused versus unfocused. We actually have more studies 
that have focused experimental groups with a control group than we do studies where we have focused and unfocused in a single study design. The studies that you see here show that the focused groups outperformed the control groups. Okay, so although there is that more recent study that came up in the last slide, the Van Boy again 2012, that found that students that received direct unfocused WCF made fewer errors on new writing than other groups. Those other groups are indirect feedback, self-editing, and additional writing. Okay, so this is not focused versus unfocused, but in this study, the 2012 Van Boy again, the unfocused group made fewer errors than the other groups. Okay, so maybe a little slightly mixed picture there, but there are a number of other studies in the literature that show that focused WCF groups outperform control groups. Okay, so it's maybe some positive evidence for focused WCF. We do have a handful of studies that have focus versus unfocus in a single study design, and I have a couple of them here listed. The Ellis 2008 is actually in an EFL context in Japan, and the Sheen is in an ESL context at a community college in the U.S. The Ellis study found little difference between the focus and unfocus group. They both outperformed the control group. The Sheen, however, found that the focused group made more gains than the unfocused group. So, unfortunately, there are just very few studies that have focus versus unfocus in a single study design, and the ones that we do have show a relatively mixed picture. Okay, so let me recap some of what, what we have as evidence. There is positive evidence for direct and indirect WCF for short-term gains in accuracy. If we think of it as a revision tool, there's certainly positive evidence for that. There's also some positive evidence for direct WCF for long-term gains, but I wouldn't say that that's conclusive evidence. We just have some well-designed studies that lead us in that direction. Finally, there's a mixed and incomplete picture for focused versus unfocused. And this brings me back to uh, the opening of the webinar where I said that I felt that the mixed research picture along with some of the issues that we've already discussed, the time-consuming nature, for example, is one of the reasons that we need to have a dialogue about what type of feedback we're giving. I think it's up to us, given the research picture, to experiment in our classes with what works. Here are some caveats for the literature in this field. We have a relatively limited number of studies overall, especially ones that chart long-term gains. We have a limited number of studies without design and methodology issues. And then there's the other learning variables factors, right? As with a lot of educational research. So if, if this would especially impact the uh, long-term studies, right? Because if we look at an experimental group over 14 weeks, let's say, we're going to want to know what other things contributed to their learning. Did they go to a learning center on campus? Did they hire a tutor? Did they work harder than the control group? There are many variables, and it's a hard thing to, to fully um, quantify. Then there's the limited grammatical focus of some studies, just focusing on one grammar point, for, for example. It's hard for us to then extrapolate and say that any type of feedback would work for all grammar points. So we have a bit of a research picture about where we are now. I thought I would like to offer how students view WCF. There's a lot of research out there that involves surveys of students and what they feel about WCF. And the research shows that students believe WCF helps improve their writing. Truscott, by the way, would say that's not the most important thing. The most important thing is that we're the experts and that we should decide the pedagogy. I always feel that it's useful to hear from my students, though, and I think many of you have probably had that same experience where you get feedback from your students on their learning and it, you really gain insight from what they offer. I often do a midterm survey in this spirit. But to go back to the research that students believe that it helps improve their writing, they believe it's important for grammar errors. I'm sure that that just confirms your own experience, right? Many of our students are saying we want our grammar errors uh, 
corrected. But students don't just want correction on their errors, they also want teacher comments. Right? And that's, I think, confirmed by my own experience as a writer working with editors. We all want to know uh, sort of the big picture. We want to know how we're doing beyond just what the things to fix are. And then I thought I would include this last study. I found it interesting. It's really only one that I can find that has these results. So, you know, truth is with caution. This last study, the Montgomery and Baker, was at Brigham Young. And it was with about uh, 90 plus students and 15 teachers. And the results were that students perceive receiving more corrective feedback than teachers perceive giving. So I think that's interesting. Perhaps we can think back to our own days of writing, our own college days, when we would get a paper back. And I think if you just got comments, perhaps at the very end, good job, you know, well organized and then a grade, you might feel like you didn't get a lot of feedback. But if you had had corrections within each paragraph, because it's your writing, it can feel like a lot, I think, when it's our writing. So that's something to think about. OK. I'd like to make some initial recommendations based on the research picture and just based on my 20 years of teaching writing. I would say focus on how WCF can motivate your students and show your students your corrective thinking process. And I'm going to talk in more detail about both of these, and this leads into the final section of the webinar. So let me first talk about the role of motivation. I can't emphasize this enough. I try to make motivation the goal of everything I do in writing classes. This is especially true with WCF. This is because we know our students are resistant to writing. Um, I've observed this for many years. In fact, about eight years ago, I decided to, act, uh, to add a couple of new questions to my first day questionnaire. You know, that questionnaire where you ask students you know, what you expect from the course and that kind of thing. I started asking students, how much do you enjoy writing in your native language? And I gave options to select, a lot, somewhat, not a lot, not at all. And then I asked, how much do you enjoy writing in English, with the same options? I thought I'd find that many enjoy writing in their native language more than English. But what I've collected over the years are responses that are similar for both questions. And I've never had a majority of students say a lot for their native language or English. In fact, it's typically only one or two out of the entire class every semester for the last eight years. This is just anecdotal, but it confirms what I already observed and what I suspect many of you observe, and that is resistance to writing, especially writing um, that where there's pressure, where they feel that they have to pass an exam at the end, right? Writing is a long-haul process. It requires patience, focus, persistence. Um, there are many reasons why students are resistant, and we could talk, we could have a whole other webinar on that. But I know that some students are resistant, but I know at the same time that they need writing to meet their academic goals. So I try to use motivation wherever I can. Okay, and so these approaches I'm going to talk about, top five approaches to written corrective feedback that I've found successful in my classroom over the last 20 years are all connected to motivation in some way. I try to make the process as engaging and interesting as possible. OK, so I'm going to talk about the first approach. And that is to correct less and instead bring WCF into the classroom more. Okay, So procedurally, how this works in my class is that I will take a draft. It could be a first draft or a second draft. It would depend. And I give indirect feedback in the form of underlining. I'm going to underline things that I think are key problems. I don't underline every error, but I underline patterns of error. I underline errors that are significant that would impact the meaning. And I might make some comments as well. But I've cut down my workload in half because underlining as a method, as opposed to unfocused direct feedback, is it's 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 a much shorter time frame for each paper. 
So what I do is I take those papers where I've given indirect feedback and I come to my class and I hand out the papers in class and I let the students know that we're going to do an in-class revision session. Okay, And the timing of this will depend on what you're having them uh, re revise, but I have them start revising in class and then they can finish revising at home. So I found this to be very successful. One of the things that happens is that my students seem very pleased that they're able to actually correct many of the errors on their own. And I find that using indirect feedback allows for active problem solving, active learning, but any frustration that comes with this type of feedback is mitigated by the fact that I'm there on the spot to work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Because what I do about five minutes into this process is I start walking around the room and I'm checking in on everyone. And I'm usually able to see every single person in the class. Not everybody needs me, but they know that I'm there and they also have their colleagues there. Right? So again, this reduces time spent grading for drafts. It makes for better drafts, it provides one-on-one -on -one guidance, it's more engaging to come in the class and do a revision session there, sort of builds confidence. They can start revising there and then they can finish revising at home. Okay, I want to just talk now about my second top approach. This is where I review my corrective thinking process in class. Think about it right now. When you're at home grading or you're in your office grading, and you're spending hours repairing errors, who is the audience for that thinking? You, right? You are the main audience for that, and you are honing your editing skills. I would urge you to bring your corrective thinking process more in class, and that can actually create a very engaging session where students can ask you things on the spot. So in terms of how I do this, I take a set of papers, and I usually do this around midterm time when I already know my class pretty well and I know what the writing issues are. And I can say that my class has these three to four writing issues. And I look at my students' papers and I pick representative samples for the types of issues that they're dealing with. And I correct those excerpts only. And I ask, um, and I, I correct with direct feedback. And then when I come to class, I project those excerpts and I walk students through my corrective thinking process. And I find that this reduces my time spent grading drafts because I'm not grading every draft. I'm going to have this review session in class and then they'll go home and they will grade, they will, I'm sorry, they will correct for the things that we discussed in the session. But I find this very engaging. Students are able to ask me questions on the spot. They're able to hear my thinking. So this brings the thinking into the class, all that thinking that you're doing at home, bringing it into the class, reduces your time spent grading, and it allows you to focus on the things that the students are actually struggling with. OK. My third approach is to vary my feedback throughout the term. I think this is important. I think sometimes in departments we we sort of adopt an approach and maybe we will take that approach throughout the semester that's sort of like the dominant approach that everybody agrees upon. I think doing the same approach throughout the semester can become monotonous for the students. I think it's more dynamic to offer different types of feedback. I don't want to have, you know, I don't want to swing wildly from different types of feedback throughout the semester, but I want to vary enough that there are different modalities for different students and that I can adjust and be flexible for what's needed at the start of the term may be different than what's needed at the end of the term. And I feel like I'm able to sort of connect with more students this way. Finally, uh, I'm sorry, I have actually two more approaches. Uh, the fourth approach is for at-home review, especially for second or third drafts, I tend to provide focused direct metalinguistic feedback for targeted grammatical accuracy. Okay, my, my rationale for this is that um, I feel that I don't want to, I want focused feedback so that I can avoid cognitive overload. I feel that if I'm not going to come into class and cover 10, 15, or more grammar points, I'm not going to ask students to do that in a revision session at home. So I provide focused feedback, and I also provide direct feedback 
because I feel like they're at home and underlining alone is often frustrating for students. And so I feel that my main, what I've found as a rhythm that works for me is to do indirect feedback in, in class revision sessions. And when I send a draft home to use focused, direct, or metalinguistic feedback. And finally, my last approach is to tie WCF to in-class learning. I think this is really important. I think students want to know that what they're doing in class connects to their writing, right? So I think it's important that if you are studying verb tense and non-count nouns and you know, whatever three or four grammar points that you're working on, that you then ask students to target that in WCF, that you have a draft where you ask students to look for the things where you're actually, that you're actually uh, working on in class. I think this is, adds to motivation because students are, you know, there's a tether, there's a connection between their in-class work and their writing. And I think it also lowers frustration. Students are not attempting to focus on a high number of items that they have never encountered, right? Um, if you think about it, if we correct every error, we may be correcting things that students have never even had a chance to study at, study in a classroom. And that can lead to frustration. So that's my final approach. Thank you everyone for listening. I'm looking forward to a spirited Q&A. I see lots of people uh, adding things as we've gone along. You have my references here for the research section. And now I believe we have time, at least 10 minutes, I would say, for Q&A. We do indeed. Thank you very much, Jean. Really interesting session. And um, there's been a lot of chat and a lot of questions. And, oh, uh, terrific. So, yes, we've certainly got enough uh, for the rest of the session. So let me start with um, a question from Rebecca Disbro, um, who asked, um, when you were talking earlier about sharing um, a proficient speaker's version with students as part of their feedback, um, mm -hmm. whether there's a risk that that's essentially giving students material that they might plagiarize. Hmm, that's an interesting, thank you for, for bringing that up. Um, I think, you know, this is, this is used for the purposes of learning, so you're not uh, reformulating an entire paper, you're reformulating a section uh, where the student can look at their original and compare to, to your correct version, right? So potentially, they may want to use the correct version in the new, in the new uh, paper, but that's been a collaborative process through, with the student and the teacher. The, the goal of reformulation is to have a correct sample that a student, much like you, when you look at an electronic, uh, in electronic feedback, when you look at a concordance file with correct samples, here's a correct sample for your sentence, right? And so that you have an opportunity to review the, your original and see how it was corrected. So I think, um, I think that that may circumvent the issue of plagiarism. Okay, thanks. Um, a question now for um, going going back to um, Truscott students in the um, the the survey and research you were talking about earlier. Yes. Um, so uh, what what about those students? Were they happy not to have feedback? That's a question from Aaron Butson. Yeah. Well, you know, the the there's nothing in the actual article in the study that talks about whether or not they were unhappy with having not having feedback, but that's certainly an issue, and that is why we have a smaller amount of research in this field. You know, there are many. Uh, teacher researchers that do not want to include a control group because of this very, you know, there's an ethical issue here. Uh, so I think that this sometimes comes down to a split between teacher researchers and those uh, in the field of second language acquisition. And I think many of the teacher, teacher researchers are wary of having a control group because of that reason, someone is not receiving feedback. And mm. so unfortunately, many, uh, we have many studies where there's no control group and we have to interpret those, those results cautiously. But 
uh, you know, it was done in an ethical spirit. Okay, thanks. A uh, question now, an interesting one, given how many webinars we've had on, on blended learning in the flipped classroom. Deborah Holman asks, um, you talked about bringing um, WCF into the class. Is that like flipping the class, essentially? It, it flips the entire process, right? Because right now what's happening is that uh, you go home and you work for hours and hours and hours. <laughs> we talked about the many hours at the beginning of this session, right? And that's a lot of editing, right? And the audience there is you. And then you hand that off to students and they go home and potentially struggle. Maybe they understand it, maybe they don't. And this flips the whole process. This brings it into the classroom. I think it makes it more engaging for the students. They can ask you questions right there on the spot. One thing for me, and this goes to the in-class revision sessions and this issue that we're talking about now with the flipped class of bringing your corrective thinking process into the class is that I think emerging writers in English need more time that's guided. I think being at home alone with a blank page is very challenging. And if you can bring more time into the classroom, I've, I've found that it's very successful. I feel that students feel supported. They feel guided. They feel like they have a collaborative group that they're the whole class. We're working on this together with me as a guide. I've had great success with it. OK, thanks. Um, you, you mentioned earlier an approach where um, you uh, address some of the um, issues in, in students' work by project, projecting it on screen and, um, and answering and, and dealing with some of the issues there. Um, how do students feel when that's happening to them? Um, and how do you deal with any issues that might arise? Yeah, good question. I, that's always anonymous. I didn't mention that when I talked about the procedure. But that's always anonymous. Although what I found is that students tend to admit in the class that it's their paper, even though I've, made, I've, I've told the students that these are anonymous excerpts. We, you know, no names are being mentioned. Uh, many students have actually willingly said, oh, that's mine, and wanted to talk about it. I haven't had a negative experience. I, I suspect if you put names up without asking, that would be, that could be a breach that could cause maybe some negative feelings. But I, I've had positive experience with it. So you, you leave it We're to... We're working with to their actual errors. Yeah. So you, you leave it to, to the students to, um, to actually deal with, um, uh, to deal with uh, whether they want to be anonymous or not, or whether they'd rather not be anonymous. I always leave it anonymous. You know, I'll ask students in advance. I'll say, you know, I'd like to use an excerpt. Would you mind? I'm not going to use your name. And they say, OK. You know, I've done that many times. So even though I'm not using their name, I just go ahead and ask anyway, would you mind if it's your, you know, and I think this is something where you can kind of get a sense of your students too and how well you know them at that point. But I, I will often just ask in advance, hey, do you mind if I use this section in class? I won't use your name. And I've never had anyone say no. Um, and then I've had students reveal their name during the process. So, but I do think it's important to ask and to make it anonymous. And I also um, always encourage students, whenever we're reviewing anyone's uh, work, even though I'm going through the, my, my corrective thinking process with them, but since their work is up there, I always ask students to please be respectful of, you know, and try to imagine how you would want your writing talked about. So I try to do a lot of work on creating a comfortable atmosphere, and that's part of that. Great, thanks. Um, question now from Melissa Carrion. Do you ever use editing logs? I have used editing logs. I have used editing logs uh, for students with patterns of errors. And I feel that it's been very useful. I, I did that actually with, with lower levels. I'm working actually with graduate students this semester. And I don't have them doing that now. But I've done it a lot with lower levels. And I think it's, it really helps create awareness. I think that this is a really important thing. Uh, and I think, I think an error log is useful because I think if we hand back papers and we don't do corrective thinking in class, and we're not doing in-class sessions, we don't really know how carefully our students are looking at their work and looking at our feedback. And I think if you ask them to put an error log together, you're, you're getting them to create an awareness about the errors that they're making. So I, I highly recommend it. Okay, thanks. Um, 
question now. Sorry, I've got so many questions, it's going to be a difficult, difficult to fit them all in, but I will ask as many as possible. Um, we had a very interesting one from Robert Hughes, who was asking about how our approach should depend on where students are in the writing developments, and whether what worked, say, for L2 writers might not work so much for, um, so beginner level L2 writers might not work so well for upper intermediates. Um, so do you have any thoughts on, on how you'd, you'd vary these according to the, the level of your students? Yeah, I do think we have to think about that when we're giving corrective feedback. I think, I think about unfocused feedback, and I, we talked about this a little bit earlier, that there's a disconnect between, I think, the theory or at least the common wisdom in our field about trying to focus our feedback and the reality, which is many are giving unfocused feedback. And I think that's something, uh, the amount of error that you're going to correct, I think that's certainly something that we need to think about in terms of corrective feedback from level to level. You know, if we have a lower level student and we're correcting everything, I think it can be so disheartening. You're at such a fragile stage and just overwhelming cognitively. It's just maybe not the ability to, to repair all of these different types of errors. So I think we do have to be careful about the types of feedback we use at different levels. Okay, thanks. Question now, another interesting one, I think, from Debbie Tebbett, who asks, um, what are your thoughts on peer feedback? Yeah, I've talked a lot about peer feedback with my colleagues and, you know, and at other, other times. I have taken the approach with peer feedback that it's especially useful for having an audience, so it gives students an opportunity to have an audience other than me for their writing. And I like to do peer feedback that is very focused. So I will ask students to read something and say something that is a strength about whatever they read and say if they can say if there's a section or two that they feel is unclear to them. And that's all I really ask of students to do in peer review. I like to do it so that it gives students an opportunity to have an audience and get some feedback on clarity where meaning may have broken down. But I think beyond that, in terms of having peers uh, correct grammar or give grammar advice, I feel it's too much pressure. That's how I feel. It's too much pressure for my students. And so I try to focus it on clarity and on strengths. Okay, thanks. Um, question now, um, really interesting, I'm afraid I've just missed, oh, from Luciana Dantas, who asks, how you corrected your students before you looked into this research? So how how's your research affected you? It has. It has a lot. I think um, I did a lot more of sending the paper away at home and just hoping it would come back magically, <laughs> uh, magically terrific. And the main way that it's affected my work is that I do more in class. I'm trying to bring a lot of these uh, approaches into the classroom. That's, I would say, the biggest thing that I, after reading all the research and working with my students for 20 years and seeing that Wow, it was sort of what we started with at the beginning of this, where you know you send something home and it comes back and you think, "Wow, did they read my feedback? Did they understand my feedback?" You know, having that disconnect. You know, you've spent. You know, if if you're looking at a long essay, for example, you could have spent thirty or more minutes grading a paper. Am I right? And that's a long time to spend on papers, and sometimes more. And then perhaps you get it back and you see, "Wow, I did someone even look at that?" And I think that that's something that's just been an experience it's sort of outside of the research. But I think that's another reason for me that I want to bring more into the classroom. I think, you know, it's not simply because I think students can't do it on their own. I think it's because it's more engaging in the classroom. I think, I think we need to work together more with writing. And if you think about it, if you were at Cambridge University Press here, and lots of editors working together and the editors have editors and they all work together collaboratively and writers do have to be alone at times but often they are not alone they have others to bounce ideas off of so I think that that's the big change in my uh, 
approach is that I'm bringing more into the classroom and that's based partly on the research and partly on on my own experience. Thanks. A question now from Ingrid Bowman who asks um, whether you share the um, share some of the research um, that uh, the research results on WCF with your students so that um, the more traditional students can have their expectations of teacher corrections sort of challenged with with evidence that will make them more sort of supportive of it? Well, I always try to let my students know I think we have to frame what we're doing. I, I, I'm a big believer in this. I try to all along the way frame what I'm doing and let students know what I'm doing. I try to have a sort of a transparent process about why I'm doing something. So I often, when, when I think it's appropriate, I let them know what the research says and that that, that maybe is underpinning what I'm doing. Um, you know, there's not research for every single teaching practice we have out there, but certainly when I'm using a research-based approach, I like to let students know that the research shows this, and I think that they like to hear that. You know, it gives a, give them a sense of confidence. So I think that that's an important way to frame for students what you're doing. Yeah, thanks. Um, question, I just have one final question now from Erin Butson, who asks, when um, WCF stops and proofreading starts, and um, to what extent is there a risk that the writer's voice gets lost? Hmm. In terms of all of the WCF we've talked about, or was there a particular type of WCF? It might have been quite general. Um, Aaron, if you um, if you have a um, a specific bit you, you you meant, if you could just type that into the chat. But um, uh, when comprehension I do is worry. at risk. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I do worry with direct feedback that's unfocused, for example. I, I don't know if this will answer the question, but I think a direct feedback that's unfocused, meaning all of the errors have been corrected, I think that that could become a, a sort of a proofing, becomes a proof, proofing process. And for the student, I think it becomes, you know, it it's, it's away from a learning process, and that becomes like a typing process. You know, they're just sort of fixing errors. Uh, that that concerns me, and I think that unfocused feedback is not uncommon. So it, it's a concern, I think, for students and their learning. Okay, okay. Well, thank you very much, Jean. I'm afraid, everyone, that's all we've got time for. Um, but don't forget that we'll be back next week at the earlier time of, of 3 o'clock in the afternoon UK time, 10 in the morning Eastern time in the US, when Victoria Bubier will be talking about using tablets and ebooks in class. And you can sign up for that session by visiting our events page. I'll just type that into the chat as I'm saying this. Um, okay. There we go. But um, thank you very much, Jean. That was really interesting. Um, well, thanks, so thanks to questions. all of the people attending and, and adding in really wonderful and thought-provoking questions in the chat. I really appreciate that. It's inspiring me. And I, I hope we'll be able to have you back back sometime. Yes, we've already had a number of people saying in the chat how much they'd like to like to hear another webinar from you. So we'll have to see what we can do there. Terrific. But thank you, thank you very much, Jean. Thank you, thank you very much.